Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. What sort of things are we made out of? What are the basic constituents of matter? So you can't really think of a more basic question than that. Uh, you can't really ask anything simpler than that. And once we figure out what stuff's made out of, we'd like to know how do these things interact with one another? Are there really simple laws that can describe the way that stuff interacts with other stuff? Right. So that's another really simple question. And uh, one of the things that we're always looking for are, are there simple sort of unifying under law, uh, uh, excuse me, unifying uh, laws underneath a variety of different phenomena. So we don't want to have a new law every time we look at a new system. We'd like to have, be able to apply the same law to a variety of different systems. So that's something we're going to see over and over again. And as I mentioned, this, this question of what are, what are things made out of is a, is a really basic question. So it's not surprising that people didn't start asking this question yesterday. People have been asking this question for thousands of years. So. Uh, Empedocles in Greece, about 2,500 years ago, I guess, came up with the answer, earth, air, fire, and water. You probably heard that before. That's what the ancient Greeks thought everything was made out of. And what's interesting is that this is uh, not unique to the ancient Greeks. There are other cultures asking the same kinds of questions, actually, around the same time. And so this is really something that uh, civilization as a whole, humans are always been curi curious about. What is the universe made out of? <laughs> So in the intervening couple thousand years, we've made some excellent progress on what we think things are made out of. And if I went over to the chemistry department and I said, what is the universe made out of? Well, this, is, this would be the answer. You remember this from your high school chemistry class, the chart on the wall, the periodic table of the elements. So we would say the universe is made out of atoms. What kind of atoms? Well, these kinds of atoms that are listed here. And as physicists, we don't stop there. As particle physicists, we like to go to even smaller scales. So each one of those atoms has some substructure to it. And that substructure is what's shown here on the right. And this is, of course, just a cartoon. These guys in the center are the protons and the neutrons that make up an atom. This particular atom is a helium atom. And then orbiting around that nucleus, which is this is definitely not shown to scale. Actually, the nucleus makes up about oh, about a hundred thousandth of the size of an atom. So this should really just be a pinpoint at the center here. And there would be a cloud of electrons around that pinpoint at the center. So we have protons and neutrons at the center of an atom, and then electrons around that atom. Now, this is also pretty far away from the state of the art. So this is the picture that we had pretty close to the beginning of the 20th century. So Ernest Rutherford did experiments that told him that there was a pinpoint nucleus at the center of an atom. But now, uh, we know that there's actually stuff inside of that nucleus. So in particular, we think that there are, well, we more than think, we have excellent evidence that there are quarks living inside of each one of these nucleons. So inside of a proton and the neutron, there are quarks inside of there. And this is something that has been firmly established through data. This is, uh, I guess people would attribute the discovery of the quarks in the early 1970s. That was really firmly established. OK, so here's where we are today. We have this standard model. So, and uh, this is actually an artist who thought it would be cool to have representations of all of the subatomic particles. And so there's something for everyone here. And uh, so the quarks that I spoke of inside of the nucleus are mostly these guys right here, the up quark and the down quark. And so inside a proton and a neutron, you'll see some of these guys. But these aren't the whole story. We now know that there are six quarks. And we think there are at least six quarks, but probably only six quarks. And these are the six quarks. So in addition to Mr. Up and Mr. Down, we have a charm quark, a strange quark, a top quark, and a bottom quark. So these are the, the six quarks. And you can ask, well, how are these quarks different from these quarks? Well, besides the fact that the ones on the left are the ones that we mostly find in matter, and the ones on the right are not, uh, these guys are much heavier than these guys. 
And the fact that they're heavier is actually related to the first thing, that we don't find these guys in matter. Because in the world of particle physics, what happens is that heavy things typically decay into light things. And so the reason that these guys are not st standing around and stable in our universe is that these guys decay very, very quickly in a fraction of a second to these guys. So these guys are unstable. And if you want to see one of these guys, you're going to have to build a particle accelerator to see it. Uh, so you're not going to see these guys around sitting in the center of your atom uh, for the most part. So uh, down here, these guys are not quarks. We give a name for them. We call them leptons. And the lepton that you know and love is the electron. But there are two other leptons that are almost exactly the same as the electron. There's the muon and also the tau. And again, just like the quarks, these guys are like their light partner. They're just a bit heavier. So this guy is like this guy, just a little bit heavier. And again, he's not stable. Because he's heavy, he has the chance to decay into the lighter guy, the electron. So electron is the one that's stable. We see that in the atom. The muon only lives for a fraction of a second and then turns into electron, plus some of these guys, neutrinos. So what are neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are different from electrons and quarks. These are not things that we see in atoms. Neutrinos are also subatomic particles. Everything on here is a subatomic particle. And neutrinos are produced, for example, copiously in the sun. So these particles interact extraordinarily weakly. You have about uh, 100 billion uh, neutrinos from the sun going through your fingernail every second. That doesn't seem to bother you. So that's how you know these things interact extremely weakly. Right? So these things hardly interact at all. Um, I think the artists decided they were like little bandits. They were running around, and it was hard to catch them, which is true. Uh, so she put little masks on them. Uh, and so we have these neutrinos, which are extremely light, almost massless. In fact, up until just a few years ago, we thought that it was possible that these neutrinos had no mass at all. And one of the advances of the last 10 to 15 years was that we really firmly established that these guys do, in fact, have a small amount of mass. So these guys are very hard to see, but we've seen them. And we also have made some measurements of what their masses are. OK, so that's sort of the cast of characters as we know it. That's our standard model. That's stuff. That's matter. That's what our answer would be for what the universe is made out of. And I had the second question at the beginning was how do things talk to one another? What are the interactions between particles? And one of the things that I emphasize is that we want to have simple underlying laws that we can apply to a variety of situations. And this has a long storied history in physics. So here's a great example. Isaac Newton here told us that we can apply the same laws to falling apples to orbiting planets. Right? So these are two very different on their face phenomena. But it's the same underlying physical law that describes these two very different situations. And there are several examples of this kind of thing in physics, where we're able to unify different theories into a single theory. And there's also another kind of unification. A second kind of unification takes two different theories and is able to unify them into a single underlying theory. So Einstein had a theory of special relativity. And that theory of special relativity tells us how things that are moving very quickly, very close to the speed of light, behave. Right? That's this theory of special relativity. And then when you're dealing with very small things, you need to have a theory of quantum mechanics. So these are quantum mechanics. So they're hard at work. <laughs> and then you could ask the question, what happens if you have very small things going very, very fast? What do you do? Well, it turns out, in that theory, you need a theory of, so you need a theory of small, fast things. And the theory that uh, describes that, at least for electromagnetism, is what the theory of called, what's called quantum electrodynamics. And this is Richard Feynman. And he was instrumental in the development of quantum electrodynamics. And this is the theory that describes electricity and magnetism when applied to very, very small things going very, very fast. And as a particle physicist, that's a theory that I care about. I care about very, very small things going very, very fast. That's the mathematics that I need to describe things going on at particle accelerators. So in addition to the stuff, the matter over here, we now know that there are also particles responsible for mediating forces between the stuff.
So what are the forces that we know about? Well, I already talked a little bit about electricity and magnetism, and that's the theory of quantum electrodynamics. And there's a particle associated with me the mediation of electric and magnetic forces. And that particle is known as the photon. And so how can I think about a particle being responsible for a force? Well, imagine I have one particle over here and another particle over here, and these particles are going to try and exert a force on one another. So say I have a positive charge and a negative charge. And we know that opposite charges attract. And how does that attraction happen? Well, the way that that attraction happens is actually through the exchange of photons between those two particles. In fact, it might be easier to visualize if we thought about opposite charges, which repel. Because then if I thought about throwing a photon to this guy over here, when this photon hits this guy, this guy is going to recoil backwards. And so you could think of the exchange of photons as uh, being a reason for two particles exerting a force on one another. So photons are only part of the story. That only tells us about electricity and magnetism. But we certainly observe more than just electricity and magnetism in our universe. There are two other forces that fit very nicely in the standard model. One of those is what's called the strong force, uh, which has the name QCD. This is also, again, for quantum and dynamics. And this is, in fact, chromodynamics, because we use a language of color to describe uh, the different kinds of gluons and different kinds of quarks uh, in this theory. So we, we like to give things whimsical names in uh, particle physics. So we have a particle called the gluon. And the reason it's called the gluon is that its job is to glue together the quarks inside of the proton and the neutron. And it actually has another important function. This gluon also holds together this nucleus. Because after all, if I thought about what's going on inside of this nucleus, I'd have two protons and two neutrons. And two protons, those are two positively charged objects. And so those two positively charged objects, they would like to repel. And so if there was nothing else holding those protons together, this nucleus would blow itself apart. And it's the gluons that are holding this nucleus together. So now we've met the photon, which is responsible for electricity and magnetism. We met the gluon, which is responsible for the strong force. It's strongly holding this together. And then the last guys are the weak force, which are mediated by what we call the W boson and the Z boson. And these guys are an awful lot like the photon, except for they are very, very heavy. And it turns out, because they are very, very heavy, they are only important at very short distances. And so unlike electricity and magnetism, which can be important over long distances, the weak force only is important over very small distances. And the most common manifestation of the weak force is uh, nuclear decays, for example happen via the weak force. So you may have noticed that there's another force that you uh, feel in your everyday life that I haven't said anything about. And that's the force of gravity. So everybody learns about gravity. But that didn't fit in my beautiful standard model picture. So what happened there? Well, we don't know how to fit gravity into the standard model. So it turns out that gravity doesn't play very nicely with quantum mechanics. So you might ask, well, if you aren't going to include gravity, isn't that completely bogus, right? I mean, gravity is obviously very important. If I drop something, it falls. And you're going to try and tell me about the dynamics of particles while ignoring this very important force. So why is that an OK thing to do? Well, gravity is really weak. How can I tell that it's really weak? Well, imagine I have a paperclip. I can hold that paperclip up with a magnet. What's pulling against that paperclip? The Earth, right? So I have a small magnet. And I have the Earth. And the magnet wins. OK? So, so gravity is pretty weak. So that's a pretty stark uh, illustration of how weak gravity is. And so why is gravity ever important? Well, the reason gravity is ever important is that there are a lot of atoms in the Earth. And all of those atoms are attractive. And so you have a chance for those guys to build up and give an important gravitational effect. Whereas a lot of times, if you're talking about electromagnetism, uh, these things cancel out, right? Because atoms are neutral. You have positive charges in atoms in the center of the atom. You have negative charges in the electron. But the whole atom is neutral. 
So if we look at distances far away from the atom, that charge screens each other, so the whole atom is neutral. So those don't build up in the same way. So it's because of that that gravity can ever matter. But if I'm just talking about single particles, then I don't care about gravity. Gravity is way weaker than the other forces. And this is actually the reason it's very hard to test theories of quantum gravity. You may have heard the statement that it's hard to test string theory. Well, one of the reasons that it's hard to test string theory, at least right now, is precisely this, because it's very difficult to test quantum gravitational effects because they're so weak. OK. So the way I've described things, it sounds like we're in great shape. right? I have this beautiful theory, except for this gravity point. But if all I want to talk about is particle physics, I'm essentially done. right? I have this theory of the six quarks that I showed you. I have the six leptons, the neutrinos, the electron, the muon, and the tau. And then I also told you how they talk to each other. There was QCD, which was the strong force. There's QED, which was the photon. And then there's the weak force. End of the story, right? Everything's great. Well, not so great. Uh, so I want to draw a historical analogy here. So Lord Kelvin in 1900 uh, said that things, there, was, there was beauty and clearness of theory, but it was overshadowed by two clouds. So he thought, well, things are it was a pretty good framework, but there are really two important problems with the theory at that time. And uh, so the two, the two dark clouds at the time uh, were the null result of Michelson and Morley and problems with the black body theory. Now, I, we, if we wanted to go into detail, that would probably be a whole other Saturday morning physics talk about each of these, uh, which we're not going to have time for. But I just want to remind you a little bit about what each of these things were and how important they were to the development of physics. So, the experiment of Michelson and Morley uh, was an experiment to look for the ether. So this was, at the time, people thought that the light was a wave. And like water waves, which traveled through water, or sound waves that traveled through air, light should also travel through some medium. And so if light were traveling through this medium, then we should be able to see the motion of the Earth through that medium. And what they found was they had an experiment that should have been sensitive to the motion of the Earth through that medium, and they didn't see it. So there was no medium. There was uh, no ether there for that light to be traveling through. And the second one was problems with the black body theory. So this, I actually uh, think I can explain relatively quickly. So uh, we're going to do a quick demonstration to illustrate what that's all about. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run uh, a current through a rather substantial current through this uh, carbon rod. And uh, it's going to heat it up to very high temperatures. This sky starts to glow. You'll actually see it glowing up there before you see it glowing here, because the camera is sensitive to infrared uh, as well. So that's getting very bright up here. And down here, you can see it's actually uh, doing a little bit more than glowing. So we're going to turn that back off. OK. And there was a theory, a classical theory, which said, given how much Given a certain amount of temperature, so 5,000 Kelvin is this curve, I should emit a certain amount of intensity at a given wavelength of light. So here we saw something going orange, and the wavelength for orange is, uh, I guess, sitting somewhere over around in here. Uh, and so you would see a certain amount of intensity at that wavelength. And this curve for 5,000 degrees, I don't think we got quite to that high, uh, would be the curve that you would see if you did an experimental measurement. This curve in black was the classical theory of what you would predict. Well, the first thing you notice is that these curves are nothing like one another. And so that by itself was already a problem, because there was a pretty stark disagreement between the classical theory and what was observed observationally. Now, the other thing you might notice about this curve is not only does it not look like this curve, it looks like it's blowing up at the origin. And they actually had a name for this. They called this the ultraviolet catastrophe. And the reason they called it the ultraviolet catastrophe is because as you go to smaller and smaller wavelengths, that's more and more violet light. And so this is towards the ultraviolet, and this would be towards the infrared. And so they, as you go to the ultraviolet, the amount of energy that a body at say 5,000 degrees, or any temperature really, gives off in those very short wavelengths of light 
would be blowing up. So that was the ultraviolet catastrophe. And the resolution to these two dark clouds were two fundamental changes in the way that we thought about theoretical physics. So the null results of Michelson and Morley was instrumental in establishing the theoretical underpinnings of special relativity. The problems with the black body theory came and were solved by Planck, Max Planck, and that was instrumental in the development of quantum mechanics. So there were these two dark clouds, these two experimental results that people talked about as being real problems for the beauty and clarity of the theory that they had at the time, and they led to two huge revolutions in thought. And what I think is really exciting is that today we have at least two dark clouds. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about those dark clouds. And what we, as I as a physicist, are hoping, and why I'm so excited right now, is I think that there's a real possibility that these dark clouds could also lead to two real or more revolutions in thought and how we think about subatomic particle physics. OK. So time for the first dark cloud. So this one happily even has the word dark in it. So this one is dark matter. And so this guy is Fritz Zwicky. And uh, he, in the 1930s, as early as the 1930s, uh, had the notion that there must be something out there other than ordinary matter. And he called it dark matter. And if you see this picture, maybe you understand why not everyone took him completely seriously. Um, <laughs> I, I should say it. He was, he was a very, very accomplished uh, astrophysicist. Um, but what he noticed was that in this cluster in particular, this is known as the, the coma cluster, the galaxies seem to be moving too fast. So what do I mean by too fast? So too fast here means that these guys were going around so quickly that this cluster should, by all rights, blow itself apart. So what do I mean by blow itself apart? Well, think about if you had a tennis ball on a string. And I started swinging that around my head. So I should have had another demo. But uh, if I have a tennis ball on a string, swinging that around my head, and I start swinging it faster and faster, the tension in that string gets higher and higher. Right? It's harder and harder for that tennis ball to stay in the same place. As this is what people would call the centrifugal force, if you like. That tennis ball wants to fly off. But it doesn't fly off, because there's that string holding it there. So what's happening here is these galaxies are spinning round and around the center of this cluster. And these guys want to fly off, but they don't. And what's holding it there? Well, what's holding it there is gravity. And so that means there's something at the center of this thing that's holding these things in place. But if you, you added up the amount of mass here just by looking at the visible light, it was way too little to hold these things in place. So there had to be something else that was gravitationally holding these things in that was not lighting up. So that's the idea of dark matter. OK, so you might ask, how do I know that how fast these galaxies are going in the first place? And the answer is something that's very simple. It's just the Doppler shift. So this is the same effect that you hear when a siren comes roaring down the street and it gets higher in pitch as it's coming towards you and then gets lower in pitch as it goes away. So the, the frequency of that siren changes as it's coming towards you and then as it's going away from you. Now exactly the same thing happens with light. The frequency of light changes when it's coming towards you and when it's going away from you. When it's coming towards you, it gets more and more blue. And when it's going away from you, it gets more and more red. What this means for astronomers is if you have a spectrum that you know, and you can measure it, and then you measure that, and this is what a spectrum looks like in the laboratory, where it's sitting at rest, and you measure it again in an astrophysical object, the fact that these absorption lines shift tells you that that object is moving with some speed. And how much they shift tells you how fast it's moving. So that means. Just like the amount of the pitch would change depending on how fast that ambulance is moving towards you, this shifts according to how fast that galaxy is moving away from you. So this same technique can also be applied to other astrophysical systems. 
So another one is uh, rotation curves. And there are two curves here. So what we're supposed to be thinking about here is a galaxy. And this right here is the distance from the center of the galaxy. And this is the velocity that that, ga that galaxy is spinning. And as I go outwards in distance from the center of the galaxy, this dashed curve is what the standard theory of gravitation would predict if I just added up the visible light and I said that's what's pulling in. And the reason is, as I go further out, I couldn't imagine things can't be moving too fast or they would fly apart. It's the same physics that we talked about with uh, Fritz Wicke. But what's observed, what was observed by, among other people, Vera Rubin, uh, this photo is circa 1970, as you can tell from the dress, uh, was that the curves are actually approximately flat. And so this difference here, again, just like we saw in the case of the cluster, tells us that there's something else that's pulling inwards. So this is, again, evidence for something that's dark that's providing a gravitational pull. So that's two pieces of evidence. And here's a much more recent piece of evidence. It's called the bullet cluster. And the bullet cluster, so there's been some fake color added to this image. There are two clusters of galaxies. So clusters are just groups of galaxies. And also contained in a cluster, in addition to groups of galaxies, is a lot of hot gas. And in fact, uh, in terms of the visible matter, and that means visible in either optical or x-ray, most of the matter is actually contained in the hot gas. So the hot gas in this picture is shaded red. Now, it turns out that most of the mass, so this, what happened here is we had two, two clusters. Here's one. Here's number two. And these guys actually collided with one another. These passed through one another. And most of the mass is actually in this blue region here, where some of the galaxies are, and actually where most of the dark matter is. And we're actually able to, to tell that this is where most of the mass is because of a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. Now, gravitational lensing, I'm not going to be able to go into great detail, but the basic idea is that just like uh, this is something that Einstein told us. Just like gravity allows things to be matter to be attracted, gravity can also pull on light. Also, gravity deflects the trajectory of light. And so that means that matter, since it defect, deflects the trajectory, acts like a lens. It lenses light. So what does a lens do? It deflects the trajectory of a light ray. So does matter. And so what's happening here is that there's matter acting like a lens. And so it distorts these galaxies. And it's that dark matter that we can measure how much there is by looking at the amount of distortion that there is. So the amount of lensing tells us how much matter there is. So this blue is supposed to represent how much matter there is. And there's a bunch of matter here, and there's a bunch of matter here. But as I told you, most of the matter is supposed to be living in the x-ray gas, which is this red stuff here. And you notice that the red stuff is not overlapping with the blue stuff. So most of the matter is not where the x-ray gas is. So most of the matter, most of the stuff that's bending the light, that's distorting the images of the galaxies, is not in the x-ray. So most of the matter is actually dark. And the important thing to take away from this is that you can simulate this collision of these two clusters with and without the presence of dark matter. And it does an excellent job if you assume that there's dark matter here. And it does a horrible job if there's not. And in fact, this is important for another reason, which is that back when our data was just things that look like this, people said, well, maybe what's going on is we just don't understand how gravity behaves at long distances. Maybe Newton was wrong. Maybe if you go to really long distances, gravity starts behaving di differently. Because after all, what we're doing is we're measuring these uh, big galaxies and these big clusters. And maybe just the gravitational law changes if you go over to long distances. But this system here is very hard to reconcile with one of those pictures where you just say Einstein and Newton got it wrong. You, you can't simply change the law of gravity and explain this picture. You really need to have new stuff to explain it. And that's the reason that people were excited about this observation.
Okay, so here's where we are. So this is why it's really a dark cloud. Here's the standard model stuff, the beautiful picture that I showed you, yep. stuff we understand. And here's the dark matter. So I showed you a variety of systems where we were able to demonstrate that there was dark matter. And actually, the observations at this time have gotten so precise that we could do more than just say that there is dark matter. We can actually tell you how much dark matter there is. So we know how much dark matter there is. There's this much. We also can make measurements of how much of the ordinary matter is, there is, how much protons and neutrons, quarks, electrons, how much of, the, of matter is actually made out of standard model stuff. And the answer is there's about five times as much dark matter as there is of normal stuff. So not only is there a dark cloud, there's way more stuff in that dark cloud than there is normal stuff. So that's a serious problem. If I'm, a, as a particle physicist, I want to know what the universe is made out of, I'm doing a pretty garbage job. OK, so here's the next dark cloud, this beautiful theory that I told you about. So it doesn't always work. It works a lot of the time. So to, to demonstrate that for you, I brought what's called the particle data book. So I get one of these in the mail every two years. Uh, and in this are the results of lots of experiments that people have done at particle accelerators. And they support this beautiful theory of the standard model. This book is 1,352 pages long and has very small font. OK, so there are a lot of experiments that have been done that establish the validity of this theory. However, there are certain instances where this theory breaks down. So what do I mean by that? Well, one theory, one way that it breaks down uh, is very striking. And as I'm going to tell you about, we need one more piece to make this theory complete. And without this piece, this incredibly otherwise successful theory eventually is going to give us some nonsense predictions. So one of the things that's nonsensical is without something like the Higgs boson, if I just took my favorite theory here and I tried to just calculate from scratch, one of the things I would find is that no particles weigh anything. That's pretty bad news. Right? We know that things obviously weigh something. And so that's a pretty important piece to the puzzle. This Higgs boson is supposed to give everything else mass. And without it, we would have nothing has mass. Everything would be like the photon. Things would move at the speed of light. And you or I obviously would not exist. So it's actually even worse than that, uh, if you can imagine. And the way that it's even worse than that is there are specific instances that if I tried to calculate things in the theory, not only would I get results that are in contradiction with observation, like things don't have mass, I would get things that don't even make mathematical sense. So I would get answers like 1 plus 1 equals 3. So in particular, uh, one thing that could happen is you could uh, ask what the probability is for two particles to collide. And you would find in certain cases that the probability would be greater than 1. And if you learn nothing else in your high school statistics class, it should be that probabilities go from 0, doesn't happen, to 1, happens all the time. Probability greater than 1, I don't know what that means. OK? So that actually can, in principle, happen if there is no such thing as the Higgs boson. But it doesn't always happen. Like I said, there's a lot of things that we get right. and so. I could do most of these calculations, but it's only when the calculations start giving me nonsense do I know that something's uh, going wrong. And in fact, the theory is smart enough to tell me when that Higgs boson has to come in. Because I, I can look at those situations where those calculations are going wrong, and I know that's where the Higgs boson has to live. So the standard model is smart enough to tell us where we should be looking. It, we, we should be looking in those places, those situations where those calculations would break down. How, does, how is the Higgs particle supposed to give other particles mass? Here's the analogy. There's a scientist. So this scientist is a particle. This is a famous scientist. You can tell from the hair. And he's walking into this room. And it's filled with other physicists. They're having a cocktail party. And the other physicists get very excited. 
and they want to go say hi to this guy. And so they glom onto him. They start asking him lots of questions. How was your weekend? You know, that kind of thing. And suddenly, it gets much more difficult for him to get from one side of the room to another. Right? So if this room were empty, and he tries to get from point A to point B, no problem. Suddenly, all these people are surrounding him, and it gets much more difficult for him to move through the, the room. So I have a very simple demonstration here, just to illustrate what's going on. So I can imagine dropping, trying to pass through that room full of people, and passing through that empty room. Okay, so it's obviously much more difficult to pass through that viscous medium than it is to pass through that empty room. Another thing that's actually interesting is this analogy is, is pretty good for other reasons. How much you're affected by that medium is different for different particles. So we know that there are some particles that are very light. I showed you the electron. The electron is very light, and it had some heavy partners that I called the muon and the tau. They were supposed to be just like the electron, but heavier. So we can imagine that that guy that went through this viscous medium reasonably fast was the electron, because it's not affected very much by that viscous medium. It gets only a small mass. Now, somebody like this guy, you can see is barely moving. Let me try one that's a little bit of a brighter color. Oh, that one didn't even move at all. That's, uh, I don't know what kind of particle that would be. Uh, <laughs> So here's another one that's moving very slowly through there. So this would be the analog of a much heavier particle. It interacts much more strongly with that viscous medium, and it slows things down much, much more. So heavy particles are things that interact a lot with this medium. So that would be someone really popular. So Einstein comes in here, gets a big group of people. right? So he gets a big group of people. He has a lot of inertia. It's very hard for him to move through that room. You have someone who's really unpopular with physicists. I'm not sure exactly who that would be. Um, and he comes, they come in the room, and they don't care. And so they just go through uh, unimpeded. The top quark, which is the heaviest particle that we know about, it actually weighs about the same amount of a, as a gold nucleus, which is pretty startling if you think about it. This is a subatomic particle. This is supposed to be a fundamental particle, this quark. It weighs about the same amount as a gold atom which has a bunch of different protons and neutrons, about 175 of them, actually. So it's actually an open question, by the way, why these guys are so different. So that's something we're still thinking about. We could sort of ex explain things by saying, well, this is the guy who interacts a lot with the medium, and this is a guy who doesn't interact very much with the medium. But we'd like to be able to go a little bit deeper than that. Why are there some particles that interact a lot with the medium, and why are there some particles that don't interact very much with the medium. And that's, that's something we don't know yet. That's something that people are actively thinking about. OK, so I talked about this medium. But people always talk about this Higgs boson. In fact, I showed you the picture of that felt guy, right? And so what's the difference between this medium and the actual particle? Because people are talking about discovering this Higgs boson at accelerator. So that implies that there's some particle to see. And this medium here that I showed, this group of people, doesn't look very much like a uh, particle that's just something diffuse that should permeate our entire universe. So what do I mean by a Higgs particle? Well, the analogy here is suppose someone tells a rumor, some really juicy rumor. Then the physicists in the room start talking to each other about it. They get really excited about it, and they start congregating. And maybe that group of physicists is trying to move through the room. but as a grouping themselves, it's difficult for them, to move through, for them to move through the room because they've already formed this mass that it's hard for them to move through the group. So this is a lot like the Higgs particle. It's made out of Higgs stuff, right? The people are Higgs stuff. And what did I have to do to make it? I had to inject a rumor. And the analogy is I inject some energy. So if I inject enough energy into the system, if I inject enough energy at an accelerator, I can make a Higgs particle out of this Higgs stuff that's supposed to be everywhere in the universe. And so this guy right here, this conglomeration of Higgs stuff, is what I want to see uh, at an accelerator. Any particle accelerator, in some sense, is a time machine. Now, it's not the kind of time machine where you can go kill your grandmother and then get yourself really confused about how you had the time machine in the first place. It's a different 
kind of time machine. It's a time machine that traces back the history of the universe. But the universe is expanding. And anytime you let something expand, it tends to cool. And so that means if you go back in time, the universe was more dense and it was hotter. And so if you go back in time, you have something that was much, much hotter and much, much more energetic. And you could trace back here what happens. So we, now we have us. And if we go back in time, you get to an era where it actually was so hot that any time you formed an atom, something bounced into that atom and it disassociated it again. So any time before this time, there were no atoms. If you go back even further, it gets even hotter. Remember we talked about how there were gluons that were holding protons and neutrons together using the strong force. It's actually stronger than the electromagnetic force that is holding atoms together. Well, if you go back farther even still, the universe was so hot that not even the strong force could hold protons and neutrons together. Or if you go back even further still, you couldn't even hold quarks together inside a proton and neutron. And it turns out that there's a huge change if you go back just a little bit further. If you go back just a little bit further, which is precisely to the energies where the LHC is going to probe, the temperature gets so high that the universe goes through what's called a phase transition. So phase transitions are uh, something we see all the time. So here's a glacier melting off the coast of Greenland. So here's a phase transition between uh, ice and water. If you have a superconductor, superconductors are materials that at very low temperature have no resistance. So if you go to zero temperature, you have no resistance. And if you go to high temperature, you have some normal resistance. So there's a phase transition at some temperature where you go from having no resistance to lots of resistance, just like we went from going from being ice to water. OK, so it turns out that the universe, in a lot of ways, is a lot like a superconductor. So what's the phase transition I'm talking about? Well, the phase transition I'm talking about has to do with this Higgs medium. And it turns out, if I go to high enough temperatures, this room becomes empty. So there was a time in the universe where the Higgs was actually not giving things mass. So if I go to very high temperatures, the room is empty and no particles have mass. And then as the universe cools down, we go through a phase transition. The party starts. Everybody shows up. And then we're in a universe where it's difficult to get through this room, especially if you're a popular guy like Einstein. So we're going to be trying to probe the energies and the temperatures that are responsible for the, the Higgs mechanism at this next generation of accelerators. So I talked about these two dark clouds. So it's time for a change in the weather. And this is why physicists are so excited. The Large Hadron Collider is coming online. So here's a little animation I took from the CERN website. So here we are zooming in from outer space. There's Lake Geneva. We're on the border of France and Switzerland. And this guy is about 30 kilometers in circumference. That's about 17 miles. And that's the particle accelerator that's going to take us up to speeds very close to the speeds of light. It takes two protons almost to the speed of light. They come in through these two tunnels, and they collide inside this chamber here. So when they collide, I need to know what happened. So I need to build a very sophisticated camera. And that's what this detector is here. And so this is to set the scale. You can see this person inside this detector. This thing is huge. So in fact, here are some of the hardworking experimentalists. There are actually some Michigan folks in here. Uh, in fact, there's a Michigan sweatshirt. I don't think you can see right there. Uh, so, so some of these are Michigan folks. And they were in part responsible for building this piece of the detector. And so you can see this piece of the detector is pretty big. But you can see that it's really big when you realize that that's one of these. Okay? So, so they helped build one of these. They helped actually build a lot of these chambers out here. And so it's, it's, it's just a huge experiment. So this has been in the news recently. September 10th was the day that they actually turned on this accelerator. So this is what it looks like inside the tunnel. Uh, not now. There aren't any people down there. But uh, the, there are a bunch of magnets here that are used for accelerating these particles up to very close to the speed of light. 
And here's a control room where people are monitoring what's going on. And this is on September 10th when they uh, first turned on the accelerator. And if you had been reading other articles in the New York Times, you might have thought that what was going to happen was something like this. Uh, <laughs> there is some concern that uh, there are some people that brought a suit, actually, that they were concerned that the LHC was going to make big black holes that were going to devour the Earth. And uh, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, is that you should not lose a second's sleep over this possibility. They had a pajama party at Fermilab, because remember, this is happening. <laughs> this is at a particle laboratory in Chicago. So remember, everything is happening in Switzerland, but there are physicists all over the world who are excited about this. There's one equation in this talk. Here's the equation, E equals mc squared. And this explains why we build these accelerators uh, that are such high energy. It's because we want to make particles that have relatively high mass. And so normally, when you think of this equation, uh, if you think about how a nuclear reactor works, for example, you say we take mass, we multiply it by the speed of light squared, and that gives us energy. But you can also go the other way. If I have enough energy, then I can make a particle of a given mass. And that's what's happening at these accelerators. I have a ton of energy, and that's getting converted into mass. So now you can ask the question, once I make that mass, how do I see this thing? So I told you I have this big camera, and I'm going to use that big camera to see the Higgs particle. So this is what it looks like if you take a readout of all those sophisticated instruments. So it's a mess. All of these tracks, all these squiggly lines, are tracks of particles that they can measure going through the detector. Now, this is just computer generated at this point. They don't actually have data like this yet. But this is what they anticipate things looking like when they collide. And what happens is you could produce a Higgs boson, and that's what happened in this collision. And how the heck would I know that? Right? I mean, this looks like a total mess. So what happens is, using the same kinds of calculations that allowed us to successfully predict the things in this book, the calculations that start with that standard model that uh, I showed you and use the mathematics of quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics, all of those theories, we could predict what's going to happen. And we can find that a Higgs particle, because it's heavy, as we talked about, heavy things decay into lighter things. In principle, it could decay into two of those Z bosons. These were the guys that carried the weak force. It could do this. And then the Z bosons could decay. Each of them could decay into two muons. And muons look just like electrons, but they're heavier. But one of the nice properties of muons is they penetrate your detector very well. They go all the way to the outside of your detector. So rather, like, rather than some of these guys, which get stopped in the interior where it's a big mess, muons go all the way to the outside where things are relatively clean and clear. And so you could look for events where you see one, two, three, four of these guys. And you could also ask that two of these guys look like they came from one z, and the other two guys look like they came from another z. And if you add these two guys together, they look like they came from a single guy. So you have all these cross checks. And those cross checks allow you to understand that what you actually produced here was a Higgs boson. And what's neat is that this detector that people built at Michigan is designed precisely to see those muons. So it's possible that some of the hardware work that was done uh, by the University of Michigan could really be important for discovering the Higgs boson. OK, so in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about how I might see dark matter. So that was the other dark cloud that I talked about. Now, there's a problem. It's dark. So that means it's really hard to see. And in principle, all of those astrophysical measurements I told you about, those all rely on gravity. And gravity, as we talked about, that's really weak. So that means it would be very hard to see in my detector, number one. But number two, it would be really hard to make it in the first place. Because in order to make it, it has to interact with the stuff that I have at the beginning, which was protons. And if it's only interacting gravitationally, I'd be in serious trouble because of how weak gravitational interactions are. But we have excellent reasons to think that gravity doesn't interact just gravitationally. And one of those excellent reasons is that our universe is actually filled with dark matter. So how did dark matter get there in the first place? Well, the reason we think it got there in the first place was that in the early universe, where there was lots of things colliding with one another, some of the time, those collisions, just like the collisions at the LHC, produce dark matter. So because our universe is filled with dark matter, 
We also think that when we collide things at the LHC, we'll be able to make some dark matter. So then the question is, if I make it, how do I see it? Right? So because I said, it's hardly going to ever interact with my detector. So the thing to keep an eye on here is conservation of momentum. So the way that we would want to, uh, any, any time you have an interaction, you have to conserve momentum. So if there's something going off one way, there's going to be something going off the other way. So uh, here I have in my hand the dark matter particle that I'd like to see at my detector. And this truck is going to be other stuff that I can see easily. And the explosion, the very small explosion that I'm about to set off, is like the collision that we have at the LHC. OK, so we're going to have a collision. I'm going to create some dark matter. But imagine I couldn't see this guy. Is there any possible way that I could still infer its presence? Here's a little calcium carbide. And we'll just dump that right in there. Put this guy right here. And OK. So if I had done that a little faster, it might have gone even further. But one thing you'll notice, now it's moved. So what happened was this guy recoiled against the dark matter. So even if I didn't see that dark matter exiting the detector, I can see that it was there because I know about conservation of momentum. So that's the same principle that we're going to use to try and see dark matter. So one thing that we think is pretty likely is that it could be a super, the lightest supersymmetric particle. So what's the symmetry? Well, normal symmetries are something we're really familiar with. So uh, Leonardo da Vinci has this Vitruvian man. And there's a symmetry, a bilateral symmetry that we all more or less have. If I reflect around this axis, it looks pretty much the same. So that's what a symmetry says. You, have, you reflect in some way, and things look the same. It's, it relates to a priori different things. So I didn't know that this half had to look like this half. But it does, because there's a symmetry between those two things. So supersymmetry says that for every particle we know and love, we do a symmetry transformation, just like we reflected, reflected left to right, and we see a new particle. So for everybody we know and love, there should be a new particle. And how are these guys different from the old particle? They can't be exactly the same, because after all, we would have already seen them, right? We were good at seeing these guys on the left. So if they were exactly the same, we would have seen all these guys on the right, too. But we haven't. So they're different for two reasons. One reason is that they have different what physicists call spin, uh, which is just a subatomic property that uh, gives some very important consequences when you do these kinds of detailed calculations. And in fact, the spin of the electron is very much tied up into uh, the properties of magnetism, for example. And, but in addition to that property of spin, the other big difference is that these guys are all heavier than the standard model guys. And because they're heavier, that means it's harder to see them. Because remember, E equals mc squared. If I have something that has a big m, then I need a bunch of E to make it. And that's why we're building these huge colliders, because we need to have enough E to make these guys with the big m. So again, just like the Higgs boson, these superpartners, superpartners would decay, these superparticles would decay into other things that would allow us to see them. And one of those things that it would decay into would be the dark matter. So uh, we would do this kind of experiment. We would look for these recoils. And when we would see these recoils, uh, that would be, could, in principle, could be evidence for supersymmetry. So why do we think that this crazy theory where we double all of the particles is right? Well, there are actually several reasons. And I'm just going to try and explain uh, one of them to you very quickly before I finish. And that has to do with the following fact. The strength of forces depends on the energy of, at which you observe that force. So here's, here's the simple facts that we need to know to understand this. We know that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And big like charges repel a lot. And big opposite charges attract a lot. OK? That's the first thing we need to know. The second thing we need to know is, is E equals mc squared. And here's an electron. And the strength of that electron's attraction or repulsion has to do with how much charge it has. Now, if I have a lot of E 
then I could produce additional M. And in particular, one of the things I could do is I could produce an electron and a positron. And a positron is just the antimatter equivalent of an electron. So I could produce an electron-positron pair. I could produce those two particles. This pair shows up for a short period of time, and then it could disappear. But how many pairs I have depends on the energy that I'm looking at things. So if I have more energy, then I have more and more pairs. Now suppose I have another charge that's going by this electron. And so this guy, as it's going along here, will see some pluses and some minuses. And so effectively, it'll see a different charge than if, as if none of these pluses and minuses were here. So depending on the energy, I see more pluses and minuses. And so I see a different effective charge. And so that means that the forces effectively look like they have a different strength. And we could do this calculation quantitatively using this theory of quantum electrodynamics or quantum chromodynamics, depending on which force I'm interested in. And here's what we find. If I take the standard model stuff, here's how electricity and magnetism changes with energy. So this is energy. I'm going to higher and higher energies. And this is a really high energy. This is uh, more than a billion times higher energy than what we'd be probing at the LHC. The slope of this line depends on what your theory of nature is. If it's just the standard model, it looks like this. If it's supersymmetry, the slope is different, so it looks like this. And what we find in the standard model is that two lines meet at a point and two other lines meet at a point. Now, if you remember from Euclidean geometry, two lines meeting at a point, not very special. That happens a lot. Over here, in supersymmetry, three lines are meeting at a point. That is special. That does not happen. If I just draw three lines at random, they will not meet at a point. But if supersymmetry is correct, we find that the strength of the three forces are such that they meet at one point. So that's very suggestive. And one of the things that it's suggestive of is related to this unification thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is that all three of these forces might be unified into one force if you go to very, very high energies. And you don't see that unification if your theory is the standard model. And so because you see this with supersymmetry, which we affectionately call Susie, uh, that people think that this is pretty good evidence that we might see supersymmetry at the LHC. So the picture that I want to leave you with is that we're on the verge, with this really high-powered fan here, of dispelling a few of these really dark clouds. So there was this fact that we didn't have a theory that worked completely well. We didn't have a theory that could explain the mass of the universe, or made sense even up to arbitrarily high energies. And we also didn't have a theory that even told us what most of the universe was, what the dark matter was. So the real hope is that the LHC is going to help dispel those two dark clouds. And if we're really lucky, then the dispelling those two dark clouds will be just, have just as big as an impact as it did 100 years ago when dispelling those two dark clouds led to quantum mechanics and special relativity. So the hope would be that the LHC could have just as big of an impact, and we could really overturn the way that we think about uh, physics in fundamental ways. Thank you. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.